is the brain in the Goldilocks zone. Uh, and uh, atlases are like theories. Uh, like theories, they assist you to find your way in unknown territories. Uh, uh, neuros uh, 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 oh, that's in Spanish. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, that's, uh, I have also uh, translated in Spanish. Uh, the brain was not always on uh, the sunny side of the street. Uh, just consider the ancient Egyptians. The heedless leader discarded the brain in funerary practices and sent millennia of pharaohs brainless to their afterlife. It was uh, Hippocrates who was uh, the greatest, uh, 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 gave the greatest praise for the brain, a astoundingly modern view. Men ought to know that from the brain and from brain only derive our joys, pleasures, laughters, and jests, as well as our sorrows, pain, griefs, and tears. Unfortunately, the view was not shared by Aristotle, who thought that the brain was there to cool the blood, air conditioning. And uh, uh, the two views, uh, Aristotle's, uh, and the cardiocentric view of uh, the mind, and uh, that of Hippocrates, and subsequently uh, espoused by Galen, were battling each other out until the day of Shakespeare, the dawn of modern science. And you can see in The Merchant of Venice uh, uh, that. Um, Portia asks, where is fancy love, where is fancy bread, or in the heart, or in the head? And uh, you would have thought that science has answered that question. Until you go to buy a Valentine's Day card for your loved one, and you face, the, as I faced, the following thing in Bondi Junction in Sydney. and. Uh, 300 cards, each one with at least one red heart on them, none of them with the brain. And it forced me to write a letter in the newspaper. Darling, I love you from the bottom of my brain. And uh, a journalist from Melbourne called me. Are you insisting that the heart has nothing to do with love? I said, in, in, if in a heart transplant I receive your heart, I am not going to fall in love with your husband. She said, what a pity, and he's such a lovely man. Uh, we started our work with uh, the rat, and we produced an atlas uh, in uh, stereotaxic coordinates. Uh, and. Uh, Having gained some success there, the rat was uh, uh, being used well, I thought of trying my luck. Uh, and by the way, you can see the stereotax coordinates, how we derived them from the skull reference points and uh, the interaural line. And I thought that, well, it won't take me long to do an atlas of the human brain. But taking a step back, I thought, well, I better do an atlas of uh, uh, a non-human primate, a chimpanzee, really, I wanted uh, to do. Uh, and uh, 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 the, what was really uh, helpful in the case of the rat, and Nicholas would, uh, uh, might want to consider this in his uh, uh, thought of uh, doing a sheep's brain atlas, uh, the strain acetylcholinesterase can tell you what's happening in the brain without you being a neuroanatomist. Just look at uh, the stain here. Is there, oh, there's a mouse. Except that the mouse doesn't seem to, oh yeah, it does. You can see here, you can't mistake this structure for this structure or for this structure. The borders are already demarcated. You don't need to be a neuroanatomist, and I was not a neuroanatomist. But I found the right stain to stain the brain, and uh, look at that. Compare that, which is nissel, a well-stained tissue, well-stained nissel, with that. The same, the same area, adjacent sections. But look, 
you can't see very much in the nissel. In a cell called Nesterase, you can see. And somebody was saying at that time, Floyd Bloom, the gain in the brain is mainly in the stain. And a friend of mine sent me this. I don't always stain the mouse brain, but when I do, I prefer acetylcholinesterase. Uh, and uh, different stains offer uh, different windows to the brain. Uh, the avian brain stem here, we can see uh, the similarities, the homologies with the mammalian brain stem. Uh, and um, the different neurotransmitters, receptors, enzymes, uh, reveal to you uh, different things and we synthesize them. And we also uh, compare uh, that uh, profile uh, with other animals, including the human. So uh, it's like a Rosetta Stone acetyl nesterase or chemo architecture in that it uh, will translate from the rat to the human to the bird. You, you may not be so certain that there is a substantial nagra in the bird, but if you find dopamine cells in the midbrain, well, that is the substantial nigra in the bird. And you might, of course, say, well, the bird? Why did you ever bother to spend, as we did, five years to study the bird brain? Well, birds have first-class brains. They just haven't had good public relations. And there is the atlas we constructed of the bird brain. Uh, and this, because the bird is handy in uh, embryo, in the egg, that you make uh, a hole, you take the embryo out, put it back after the intervention, put sticky tape on the top, uh, no anesthetization, no bleeding. Uh, there have been some uh, excellent work done on development in uh, the bird, and with, um, under the guidance of Luis Bueyes uh, in Murcia, España, we produced uh, an ontology based on the development, what belongs in what, all right? Now, Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. That's not true for neuroanatomy, because if you say something is ventral, you are implying that ventralizing influences have shaped that part of the brain in development. Dorsal, dorsalizing influences. So you can't just do anything in neuroanatomy. You are not so free. And uh, we produced uh, this uh, uh, ontology on what belongs where in the brain, based only on development and indeed taking concern, looking at the neuromeres, those segments that show up now and they're nicely in development, but then they are effaced, but they seem to have lasting influence on what happens in the brain. And uh, we were so pleased about our work that we uh, thought that we'd be really lifted on the shoulders of neuroscientists when we go to uh, show our atlas to the Society for Neuroscience meeting. And we even commissioned a symphony that captures the uh, concept of constructing the avian brain atlas that happened under the direction of Nicole Duarin in Nuazon sur Marne in Paris. And the execution of the pro the project under the direction of Luis Puelles of España. And uh, will it play? No, it won't play. But I'll play it here. <coughs> this is the symphony we commissioned and uh, it was made on the occasion of the publication of uh, uh, our atlas. Ah, I don't want to go again. Okay. 
But you might say, rats and birds. What about humans? I mean, that's really where the things are. And uh, again, I was uh, optimistic and I thought that I would work on the human, but I also wanted some security in studying the brain of a non-human primate. And uh, we can see uh, here a photo of a urakodang. Really, I took a chimpanzee, but I didn't have a chimpanzee to pose for me. And uh, I wrote to the Toronga Park Zoo for the opportunity to do a post-mortem on a chimpanzee brain once a chimpanzee died. They responded they would be happy to oblige, but they had not had the death of a chimpanzee in the zoo for a decade. Two months after receiving my letter, three chimpanzees died. Luckily, they didn't suspect me, and I studied the brainstem of one of them, and uh, it led us to the construction of uh, this atlas human brainstem that we published in 2019. There was no difference between the brainstem of the chimpanzee and the brainstem of the human. <clears throat> there is the brainstem of the human. And uh, just for a second, one area that we identified was uh, the endorephstiform nucleus, uh, which you will see here, endorephstiform nucleus. And uh, here you can see it in insel, just barely, not easy to see in insel. And uh, uh, I, that nucleus I had seen 30 years ago, and uh, I didn't con uh, it wasn't uh, uh, bold enough to say that it is a different structure, uh, because you need more than one criteria to mm -hmm. uh, save yourself from rediscovering something or, or <coughs> discovering something that belongs to another structure. Uh, but I actually, in my brain, I also had this. Uh, uh, evidence that this area that we call the endorestiform nucleus receives either terminals or preterminal projections from the spinal cord. So it was in my head, but I didn't connect the two things uh, until I started uh, looking at the material again. And uh, then I said, oh, now I have the right to name the structure. And um, uh, I took my postdocs and I went to uh, the postdoc who was involved in this book and uh, I said to her, uh, I have found a nucleus. She was looking under the microscope to uh, do the final things for the atlas and she said to me, I don't have time. Uh, uh, with Charles Watson, uh, who is a more seasoned researcher, if we lack on the nucleus, uh, we uh, stop work. Charles plays the saxophone, and he plays the saxophone. That's really the reason we do these atlases. It's not to save humanity, right? If by chance somebody uses it in the theater to get a better stereotactic accuracy, or can construct an animal model of the disease, that this often happens with the mouse atlas, where there are models of uh, Alzheimer's, uh, depression, schizophrenia, epilepsy. Uh, we're pleased, but that's not while, or what really keeps, keeps us working. Uh, it's the pleasure of finding something that was not noticed previously. Uh, and again, that's the endorestiform nucleus. Uh, now, you might say, well, brainstem, that's fine and dandy. But really, the important thing is the cortex. Well, there has been somebody who did good work on the cortex, not surpassed yet. That's von Economo. And there is an occasion to his honor that we organized with Michael Petridis. And uh, we are trying, though, to uh, learn from Economo and to uh, do a map of the human brain. But as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to check non-human primates. And here is the surprise of uh, my 
career in science, this small primate, the size of a small rat, has all areas in its brain that we have. The birds don't, the, the homology is about 75%. The rat doesn't, the homology may be 90%, maybe above, a little bit above 90. This one has all the areas of the brain that we have. Uh, there are no more areas in the brain, and there are no more in our brain or its brain. And uh, here are the cortical areas of the uh, marmoset. It looks like uh, uh, French cultivated areas from air. And uh, yeah, they are homologous, those areas. Uh, we have done an atlas uh, with Jürgen May uh, from the University of Düsseldorf uh, on um, of the human brain and uh, we improved a bit on the cortex but we are not happy yet uh, and uh, they are of course another player in the domain which is uh, the scientists who try with connectivity to get areas of the brain to show up uh, and uh, by the way, here's the work from Petridis and Pandia on the correspondences between the rhesus monkey, as you can see here, uh, and even the so-called Broca's area on the left hemisphere, 45A, 45B, we've identified, they've identified firstly, and then we introduce them in our atlas of the rhesus monkey, uh, and you can see them here, 45A, 45B, in the human, and in the monkey. And uh, you might say, as one of our colleagues said, uh, don't you know that 45A and 45B, the Broca's areas, they, they uh, are only in the human? The monkey, when did you last have a conversation with the monkey? And our response was that if the right hemisphere of the human has area 45 and, and 45B and yet doesn't speak, then we have the right to name, likewise, the monkey, which doesn't speak, 45A and 45B areas uh, on the basis of site architecture, game architecture, uh, connectivity. And of course, there is this other player in the domain now, which is MRI. And uh, it's not going to do it, is it? Uh, no, it's not going to do it here, but hopefully it'll do it here. <coughs> this one, you will see the connections of uh, the rat brain. We published an atlas of uh, uh, the MRI in the rat brain, and you can see the connections, at least uh, some. Uh, you don't know which way they go, but uh, left or right, but you can know that these are left-right connections, right? Uh, and uh, that helps. And, uh, oops, my screen went dead. Why is that? Oh, no, we're here. Okay. Now, uh, we've done some post-mortem, used some post-mortem tissue to uh, study connectivity in uh, the human. You can see rather nicely if you can leave the tissue there for uh, a week <laughs> to be imaged. Uh, this is data from Duke University. We uh, just published an atlas on that. But now, we, what we are really working right now is this, uh, a imaging atlas of the living human brain. And this is one of my colleagues, the three of us working on uh, uh, the data that were obtained from him. From, he went into the magnet for about 25 hours over a long period, and uh, we got what we think are good data. And uh, that's what you need first before you do anything else, <laughs> to make sure that your data is as good as you can get it. it took us a long time, uh, and um, uh, so this atlas will be six years and more late than what we initially intended. Uh, but uh, you can see uh, the fiber connections. Of course, Colossum is in red. 
indicating left-right connections between the two hemispheres. And if the structure is in blue, uh, it is anterior-posterior, the brain to spinal cord, and in green, top and down, dorsoventral. And here, this might work. Oh, yeah, finally, something worked. Uh, that you can see, actually, the um, from one uh, side to the other, a sagittal view of Marx, Mark Shearer is his name, of his brain. And uh, uh, we are uh, just now working on that. Hopefully, in a couple of years, we will uh, complete an atlas of uh, the living human brain. And this way, give those who study a subject uh, the opportunity to see uh, our data in the same modality as uh, their data. Uh, sometimes we're lost, but you only need a Switzerland to find out where Germany, Austria, Italy, and France are. So if only we get one structure that shows up in one of the contrasts we use, then we can get all the neighbors immediately for free. And uh, there again with the connections of Mark's brain. And uh, and there is Mark in the middle. Okay. And uh, still laughing. Still laughing. Yeah. Still, he's not dead. I, it would have been otherwise if it was some years ago. Right. Now, uh, I hope I have convinced you that uh, uh, the brain is important for uh, uh, behavior uh, that you know hippocrates thought is true if if so then it's worth bothering to find out if it's the right size hence the question uh, is the brain in the goldilocks zone uh, the earth is in the goldilocks zone around the sun and uh, goldilocks you would know uh, is a little girl who went there and found descendants somewhere, found that there were three uh, porridges for three bears. Tried one, was too hot. Tried the next, was too cold. Tried the last one, just right. So the earth is not too close to be burned, not too far to be frozen. Well, is the brain in the Goldilocks zone? Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, and uh, I have written a novel about this called A River Divided. And uh, it was uh, also published in, uh, in Greek after six months working to translate it with the f help of a friend who knew Greek really well. And uh, uh, it uh, broke, maybe broke a record of uh, uh, how long it takes to do a novel. And uh, uh, I, as I was sitting there, just before submitting it for publication, a friend saw me at the coffee shop and she uh, asked, uh, and she said, how's the book? I said, well, you know, 21 years, still haven't finished. She said, my cousin's novel was published posthumously. I said, you're giving me hope. And then I had to try to find the publisher and uh, um, found one and he said, uh, what is this all about? What's the book about? I said, uh, it is uh, 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 it, it concerns identical twins raised apart. It involves human cloning. It asks the question of, of what would someone with a genetic endowment of Christ do today? Would he join Wall Street or street protests? It's actually a philosophical treatise, but it's principally about the environment. And he said, and on what shelf would I place it? And until that point, I was convinced of Woody Allen's dictum. If you are a bisexual, you double your chances for the rendezvous on a Saturday night. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, the reason for doing a book was a defeat. Everything I tried in uh, uh, activism in the environment, 
I failed. And it's really uh, failure uh, leading to defeat, uh, leading to literature. And uh, uh, the problem with the environment, I think, is uh, and, uh, impossible to solve. We are trying to solve an environmental problem with a problematic brain. Never since Narcissus looked at the reflection of its fa his face on the river and fell in love with it has there been such an adoration of a bodily organ as there is now of the brain, and never with as little justification. Uh, I asked about the environmental problem. I asked my eight-year-old granddaughter, tell me something that you will do today that does not pollute the environment. She said, running. I said, good, but if you run, you will wear out shoes more quickly and the factories will have to make more shoes and that pollutes. She said, running barefoot. I said, that is good, but if you run, you'll build up your appetite and they will have to slaughter more chicken to bring them to you to the city to eat. Then sitting in a chair, and I said, that is good, but to make the chair, you have to cut a tree. Then lying on the ground naked. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we need to understand uh, that we are not as clever as we think we are. We're in fact deluded in three major areas, uh, one of which is a hubris. Uh, we think we have a soul, we think we have free will, and we think that we're made in the image of God. Well, uh, I was telling my granddaughter about uh, this king of Corinth by the name of Sisyphus, who uh, was condemned by the gods to push a rock up the hill, only for it to fall down again and push it again the next day. Because he was narcissistic, egotistical, and insulting. And she said, like Trump. <laughs> Now, after such a battle to localize the seat of the soul, psychology loses its soul in the 1930s. Uh, before giving a similar lecture to uh, the clinical neuropsychologist of Australia, I went to the coffee and I asked people, do you have a soul? And the answer was always, pardon me? I couldn't believe that somebody would ask them that. But at one point I got an answer. The girl said, I did until I started my PhD. <laughs> and uh, as far as psychology is concerned, soul is superfluous. Uh, for scientific considerations, if the soul is where sensations become perceptions, where logic resides, where decisions are made, where love is manufactured, where memory is stored, then there is no reason to hypothesize its existence because there is already an organ that uh, is responsible for these activities. And the next uh, the next uh, delusion. Well, okay, we lost the soul, but poor humans, do they at least have free will? And of course, we have Adoni here, who is a geneticist, and at least he'll agree with half of what I'm saying. <laughs> I hope that uh, uh, psychologists uh, think that uh, behavior is the outcome of two and only two factors genetic endowment and environmental influences on that endowment. And in genes, environment, genes, environment, march, there is no a crevice for free will to join the parade. Of course, the people at large, and I found that out when a lady sat across from me uh, in, my, in the coffee shop, and uh, I asked her, excuse me, just, well, can I ask you a question? Do you have free will? 
Uh, she said, I do, but I don't think many out there have free will. And this is the paradox. Everybody thinks that they, they have free will. But for the others, not so sure. Well, neuroscientists, neuroscience has news. Uh, at least most neuroscience, neuroscientists, and of course, possibly the minority who don't think this way are correct. We don't uh, solve uh, questions in science by voting. <laughs> Uh, but most neuroscientists consider that there is no uh, freedom whatsoever, that is, none at all. There are some who consider there is a bit of freedom somewhere, freedom light. Uh, 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 and there are others, of course, who think that you are uh, responsible. And uh, Skinner, I had the pleasure of um, inviting him in, uh, to my guild to give a talk. Uh, he. Uh, it was one of the proponents that uh, these only two things that are, that are involved in behavior and nothing else. Uh, and that is, that, is, that is, in this respect, we are genes sculpted by our environment. And uh, uh, the, uh, in fact, the, the book, uh, which I actually want to leave a copy here, in case somebody wants to uh, have a, have a look. Uh, a River Divided, uh, the book involves identical twins raised apart. As different artists would sculpt different statues from the same block of marble, so different environments would uh, produce uh, different characters even in identical twins. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this unknown artist, perhaps Phidias, uh, sculpted this statue of Zeus, uh, of Apollo, in the, uh, uh, that is, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, temple of Zeus in Olympia, so the environment produces the character out of the genetic material, just like Praxiteles sculpted Hermes. And if you don't believe me, at least on, in the domain of love, <laughs> jamais, jamais, jamais connu des lois. So, if you don't believe me, believe uh, Carmen. Uh, does not obey the law. And you might say, oh, well, such a, uh, such a uh, thing, you know, where did you find that? Well, just look at those who are abandoned by their partner. Uh, over 50% of them interfere with their partner in their home, at their work, in the internet. Some of them hit her. Some of them kill her, some of them kill themselves. Suicide! If only they came to a neuroscience lecture, they would find that just as they cannot jettison the love that they have, the person cannot make themselves love them. That doesn't work that way. And the rest of the behavior, I submit, is the same, not only love. So we are according to some neuroscientists, uh, perhaps the majority, slaves of yesterday. And uh, here it is where, that is, our brain will make a decision according to any genetic predispositions and then any, any influences that has been uh, subjected to up to now, at this moment. Right? And, uh, Here's where psychologists show their brilliance. Can't, you can't believe how clever they are. They have discovered that today is tomorrow's yesterday. And they take the person who wants to achieve something, to uh, uh, 
abandon and some obsession, something, and they assist them cognitively. Of course, there is there are also the um, um, medical people, the psychiatrists, who can administer a drug to lift somebody from a state to give them a chance to improve. So, this is the critical thing. Behavior is not immutable, not at all. And uh, uh, who would not want to abandon their compulsions, obsessions, unrequited love? According to Sam Harris, the neuroscientist, the puppet, as in the puppeteer is the brain, of course, is free only to the extent that it loves its strings. And I hope that armed with the evidence of the triple delusion, we, uh, and that really we are another big primate on the planet. Uh, as E.O. Wilson said, uh, we don't know why, why we're here. Puzzled we stand before nature. We have uh, a brain with leftovers of the reptilian period. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions. Who would think that it's a clever institution that tells you that, uh, of course, HIV is a devil, but not as much of a devil as the prophylactic? Religions are obsessed with sex, and they are digging the grave of humanity by permitting overpopulation or opposing the dissemination of family planning. There's a need of a reset uh, and an understanding that in whatever else we might resemble the divine, in the brain we are made in the image of the chimpanzee. And, uh, you can see here uh, the uh, Phaethon was uh, sent back to Earth uh, by Zeus because he of the hubris of taking control of the reins of the sun. And that's where I think we find ourselves. And the book takes place in Jerusalem. And you can see here. Uh, and uh, it is, of course, in both religion. And, uh, but not with the view of uh, immortal gods. And uh, uh, there you cannot take a photo. Uh, and also on Ithaca, in Rome, again in Rome, on a divided river, Rio Salamois and Rio Negro. And uh, they originated different catchments of the Amazon basin. Some uh, carries one carries more mud, and therefore is lighter in color, Rio Solomois. And uh, the, uh, there is different acidity between the two, uh, and different temperature. Uh, and they run parallel without mixing at this point. And the uh, story, of course, in the novel is about two brothers who will meet for a moment only to be lost forever in the opposite sides of the environmental uh, debate. One constructing a hydroelectric dam in the Amazon for green energy and the other opposing it. Is it the Amazon forest here uh, with the native? You can see how long it took me to write the novel. I had the hair there. And in Buenos Aires, uh, I learned tango to get the feeling of the place. And uh, this is the medical school where, if uh, those of you who know, the polytechnic struggling in Greece, you could recognize uh, descriptions that match that. I had the pleasure of uh, my partner who was there with the polytechnic students, and she, she told me some of the events. And, uh, here I'm with Cecina Ferreira, the first girlfriend of Che Guevara, who kindly allowed me to use 
uh, her uh, this, the conversation, the interesting conversation I had with Cicina, a brilliant lady, and uh, uh, unfortunately she died last uh, year. And uh, I would like to finish by wishing you all your brain to shrink less than expected for your age. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.